recognition of reality, that A is A. I think that's how we can sum that up. That's quite a verbose sentence. Rewind it and listen to it as much as you need. But let's go on. Now that scientific knowing is something of this sort is evident, witness both those who falsely claim it and those who actually possess it, since the former merely imagine themselves to be, while the latter are also actually in the condition described in possession of scientific knowledge. Consequently, the proper object of unqualified scientific knowledge is something which cannot be other than it is. Now, the translation of the whole thought there is no opinions are permitted in science. In scientific knowledge, no opinions are permitted. He says, quote, the proper object of unqualified scientific knowledge is something which cannot be other than it is. That is the object of scientific knowledge. There may be another manner of knowing as well. That will be discussed later. Uh, Note 3, the following chapter, more particularly chapter 19. What I now assert is that, at all events, we do know by demonstration. M by demonstration, I mean a syllogism productive of scientific knowledge. An integration, a concept. A syllogism, that is, the grasp of which is eo ipso such knowledge. Grasping that syllogism, it, forming that concept, doing that integration, is the knowledge. It is, can't be separated from it, is that knowledge, scientific knowledge. Assuming then that my thesis as to the nature of scientific knowledge is correct, the premises of demonstrated knowledge must be true, primary, immediate, the premises, this is going to be the five senses, they must be true, primary, immediate, better known than, and prior to the conclusions, which is further related to them as effect is to cause. So, first you have an inductive basis, then you can deduce things within that, but induction comes first. Syllogism, there may be, indeed, without these conditions, but such syllogism, so without the conditions of concretizab concretizability, without the condition of the fact that it could be brought down to the here and now, to the five senses, uh, these, without these conditions, such syllogism not being productive of scientific knowledge will not be demonstration, will it? Syllogism that's not couched in terms that come down to reality won't be a syllogism related to reality, will it? It won't be a demonstration of reality, then will it? It won't give any knowledge about what will happen in reality, then will it? So that's when people are dealing with floating abstractions. All of their results are going to be floating. It's just the way that knowledge has to work. Uh, the premises must be true, for that which is non-existent cannot be known. So the premises are five senses, we, we, we assume them as true. We know them to be true. Now, an example might be brought up when we stick the pencil in water, in the glass of water, and you see the pencil bend. Let's interpret that. Do we know that it's true that the pencil's bending, or do we know that it's true the pencil isn't? Do we, do we accept our five senses or not? Well, put your hand down inside there and touch the pencil, and you'll feel, while simultaneously seeing your hand distorted and bent, you'll feel that the pencil is, after all, straight. So you're going to have income in, fi in your five senses from two different perspectives saying it's bent and it isn't. Is this a contradiction or not? No. Your senses are telling you validly that the water slows the light down. So your senses are giving you a, a completely true rendering of reality, and you giggle and say, look how funny it looks like the pencil's bent, when in actuality it is merely an effect of the light and the water together. So. Your senses do give you uh, information from reality. To the extent that it seems anachronous, we simply have to sort that out, figure it out, learn what it is, explain it, and know it. He says the premises must be primary and indemonstrable. So whatever premise we come down to has to be beyond demonstration. So when people ask, how do you know the five senses are valid? All you can do is just say, here, here, what do you mean? We're not dreaming. 
you, you're, no, you're under no delusions. This is reality. So he says the premises must be primary and indemonstrable. This is just, uh, you know, logical analysis of it that it comes from observation of facts and reality, the way that, that uh, dialectics and science must work. Continuing, otherwise they will require demonstration in order to be known, since to have knowledge, if it is not accidental knowledge, of things which are dem demonstrable, means precisely to have a demonstration of them. So, whatever idea you want to give to somebody, if you want to teach somebody what capitalism is, you have to concretize it for them. If you want to teach somebody what any given idea is, it's necessary, absolutely indispensable that you concretize it. Now, this is a jump, it's a jump I had to make to realize that every valid idea can be concretized. But not so far from just that, it goes much further. Not only that, but any idea to be communicated to someone else has to be concretized. It has to be broken down into a series of concretes, fed to the student, then these concretes connected back into the idea that we had before. So you have to go from abstraction and shuttle yourself down to reality, then take reality and go back up to the abstraction. It's nice if your student already has the information. We looked at that situation where a guy just integrates what he knows. But sometimes you have to give him that information then integrate it for him. The premises must be the causes, uh, the premises must be the causes of the conclusions better known than it, and prior to it, its causes, since we possess scientific knowledge of a thing only when we know its cause. So, so we've got several, there's semicolons here, so come back. The premise must be the causes of a scientific conclusion, better known than it, and prior to it. The premises must be also its causes, since we possess scientific knowledge of the thing, of a thing only when we know its cause. The premises must be prior in order to be causes. The premises must be antecedently known, this antecedent knowledge being not our mere understanding of the meaning, but knowledge of the fact as well. So it's not just an understanding of the meaning that we have. He says it's knowledge of the fact as well. Th those are the one and the same. If you understand the meaning of something, then you have knowledge of the fact of what the concretes would entail. To explain capitalism to someone who had never thought of it before, you would have to give them concretes. It would mean, in reality, these things. To explain anything, any, any uh, abstraction at all. Now, prior and better known are ambiguous terms, for there is a difference between what is prior and better known in the order of being and what is prior and better known to man. Put that in your pocket, hold on. I mean that objects nearer to sense are prior and better known to man. Okay, Objects further from sense uh, are more difficult to know. Abstractions are hard to know. Things closer to sense are easier to know. Objects without qualification prior and better known are those further from sense. Take that as you will. The most universal causes are furthest from sense, and particular causes are nearest to sense, and they are thus exactly opposed to one another.